Good morning from New York City at Columbia University's Harriman Institute. My name is Tanya Domi, and I am an adjunct professor with the Harriman Balkan Studies Program, and I will be moderating today's book talk with Professor Emily Grebel, author of Muslims and the Making of Modern Europe. We are also joined by Professor Eladar Mahili, who will be today's discussant. The Harriman Institute at Columbia University is one of the world's leading academic institutions for the study of Russia, Eurasia, and East Central Europe. Our mission is to serve our community at the university and beyond by supporting research, instruction, and dialogue, sponsoring vibrant and multidisciplinary events, and bring together our extraordinary resources of faculty, students, and alumni. We are committed to training the next generation of regional specialists to play leadership roles in setting the academic and scholarly agenda, making policy and challenging accepted truths about how we study our rapidly changing world. The Harriman Institute is delighted and I am delighted to host this book talk, launching our Balkan programming for this academic year with Professor Grubbel and Professor Mahili. Emily Grubbel is an Associate Professor of History in German, Russian, and East European Studies at Vanderbilt University. A scholar of the modern Balkans, she writes and teaches on Islam in Europe, East European societies, and law and rights. Her books include Sarajevo, 1941 to 1945, Muslims, Christians, and Jews in Hitler's Europe, and Muslims, Today's Talk, and Muslims in the Making of Modern Europe. She has won numerous awards to support her research, including grants from Fulbright, the National Endowment of Humanities, and most recently, a prestigious Guggenheim Fellowship. Ella Dermahili is an Associate Professor of History and Public Policy at Hunter College, City University of New York. He received a PhD from Princeton University and has held fellowships at Columbia University and the University of Pennsylvania. His research is on dictatorships, authoritarian regimes, and the diplomatic, economic, political, and cultural dimensions of the Cold War. His first book was the award-winning From Stalin to Mao, Albania and the Socialist World. Muslims in the Making of Modern Europe shows that Muslims were citizens of modern Europe from the beginning and in the process rethinks Europe itself. Muslims are neither newcomers or outsiders in Europe. In the 20th century, they have been central to the continent's political development and the evolution of its traditions of equality and law. Muslims in the Making of Modern Europe offers a striking new account of the history of citizenship and nation building, the emergence of minority rights and the character of secularism. In my opinion, this book by Professor Grebel is a significant contribution to the canon of historical texts about the Balkans and the modern history era, and more broadly on the role of Muslims in Europe and how Europe has persisted in positioning Muslims on the margins of society as second and third class citizens throughout modern history, and yet, she documents how they exercised agency, thereby reshaping the European project in its time. Having read this book, it has informed and deepened my understanding of present day Europe and its chaotic enlargement process with Balkan states who have significant Muslim populations. I'm also pleased to announce that book culture a close local bookstore near Columbia campus is selling this book today. There is a link on the Harriman event page enabling you to order the book. We encourage people to do so. Professor Grebel will open with her comments that will be followed by Professor Mahili's thoughts about this text. And in the meantime, as you listen, please submit 
your comments in the Zoom or on the YouTube chats. We will try to respond to as many questions, questions as possible. Professor Grebel, you have the microphone. Thank you so much, Tanya. I really appreciate the invitation to come and to speak about the book. And I'm really looking forward to um, what Eleanor has to share with us today uh, and his, his read and his comments as well. So I'm going to jump right into it um, so that we have more time at the end to respond to questions and comments. Um, <clears throat> and I'm just going to share my screen here. Uh, let's see, one second. And I just have to go to here. Sorry. I never can figure out how to do that without having to go back to the very beginning. But there we go. So, uh, I'm going to jump right in. So in 1882, uh, Abdullah, a business owner from Podgorica, we have some images here of the town, got into a fight with Montenegrin authorities about his citizenship. Abdullah was one of about a million Ottoman Muslims who found himself suddenly living in a new state after the Congress of Berlin in 1878. International diplomats had decided to redraw the political boundaries of Ottoman Europe after a series of wars and uprisings and foreign interventions, and to reallocate land from the Ottomans to Christian-led European states. Abdullah hadn't moved, the border had, and he did not like it. Lots of people were in a similar boat. There were millions of Muslims, Christians, and Jews who lived across the Balkans who became sort of reconstituted as subjects or citizens of different states. This is a map of uh, the ba Ottoman Balkans around 1850, and you can see that the Ottoman Empire controlled sweeping territories in Europe. The character of Ottoman rule and arrangements with local authorities were varied very widely, but what constituted Ottoman sovereignty and Ottoman sovereign land stretched from the Adriatic to the Black Sea and from the borders of Hungary to the Aegean. And you can see here my little arrow of where Podgorica is. Now, this political map changes radically in 1878, and it would change again in 1912 to 1913, with more Ottoman lands shifting to other European states. And you can kind of see just by the complex shading system that's going on in this map, all of the different kinds of border changes that are going on. The map would change again in 1918, in 1923, in 1941, in 1945. You get the picture. In earlier wars and border changes, Muslim status had been anchored in law and also in the international imagination to the Ottoman state. So consequently, when Muslims tended to either be expelled or deported when borders changed, or if they stayed as small communities had done in places like Serbia and Greece, they generally assumed a foreign status with limited rights. But in 1878, as Abdullah was reconciling with his new life in Montenegro, the terms of political belonging were changing. Enlightenment concepts of liberalism and liberty altered the ways that people were diplomats, great powers specifically, were thinking about states, citizenship, and Muslims. And so the great powers pressured new governments that were acquiring Ottoman lands to give citizenship to all men in their territories, regardless of religion and eager for territory and international legitimacy, Serbia, Montenegro, Greece, Bulgaria, they agreed. Austria-Hungary, which uh, occupied Bosnia-Herzegovina, consented to similar provisions. Let's see, that's not yet. So for the first time on paper, Ottoman Muslim men living in European states supposedly had the same rights as Christian men. Rights to vote and hold office, rights of liberty, religious freedom, the rights to keep one's property or be fairly compensated for it. That becomes kind of tricky. But there was a catch. They had to accept the terms of membership in the new polity and show loyalty to their new state by meeting the obligations of citizenship. That is to pay taxes, to serve in the army, to learn new languages, to send their kids to school. At home in Podgorica, Abdullah found it ludicrous that he would be required to fight for an infidel army if he wanted to stay in his home. He appears to have considered himself an Ottoman subject, even if the international community didn't. So he refused to join the army or pay taxes to Montenegro, and he's thrown in jail. I don't know much about what happens to Abdullah after that point. Um, but his cellmates may have included any of the other dozens of Muslims we know who made a similar choice, refusing to either leave or concede. 
They may have also included captured Muslim insurgents. Tens of thousands of Muslims fled to the mountains in the 1870s and 1880s. British consular reports would describe these groups as armed and lawless desperados, interpreting their rejection of this new political order right, as a rejection of law itself. And this is really important. The acceptance of the system was critical for it to work at all. Only those Muslims who agreed to the new political boundaries could count on the rights that it afforded. Abdullah's cellmates may have also included Muslims who initially agreed to go along with the new system, but then complained about it, thinking that their freedom included the right to tell foreign diplomats about discriminatory treatment or the expropriation of their property. Such complaints would mark people as rebels and traitors, as we know from a Montenegrin governor's report from Ultim. So this is a picture here of uh, the Sarajevo rebellion in 1878 to the Austro-Hungarian uh, occupation. And here we have a picture of Ultin, the town on the border of Montenegro and the Ottoman Empire. And you can see a mosque on your far right side. So a generation later, after the Balkan Wars led to another border change, Muslims who refused to send their children to public schools, um, where they argued they were being indoctrinated in Christianity, could also find themselves under court martial and marked as rebels, as Muslims in Bielopolia discovered after their town was absorbed in 1913. So from local Muslims' perspectives, it was not clear why foreign powers had the right to determine who ruled them, where borders were drawn, or what kinds of laws would dictate their lives, their property rights, and the ways that they raised their children. Some Muslims vocalized their opposition to what they saw as illegitimate states. They pointed out the hypocrisy of European ideologies that defended ideas of sovereignty while allowing Christian powers to conquer sovereign Muslim lands. And this would become a recurrent theme into the 20th century as historian Jamil Aydin has shown us. There were elite groups that contacted foreign consulates and petitioned for a reversal of borders. There were groups that hoped for the restoration of Ottoman rule. There were those that worked with Ottoman officials and there were others that went rogue. <laughs> One group of Bulgarian speaking Muslims went so far as to develop their own military and political structures, uh, refusing to integrate into the new principality of Bulgaria. They even collected taxes and appointed an ambassador to a nearby city. For many Ottoman Muslims, the system of Ottoman autonomy or sort of more broadly or generally imperial rights proved more familiar and amenable to negotiating than this emerging system of nation states uh, and even this concept of citizenship that was coming into play. So for example, in 1913, we have a group of Muslims in what is today North Macedonia who begged the British to make them uh, sub British subjects and occupy their towns rather than giving their homelands to Serbia or Greece. All right, and I'm not going to read this whole document, but we could come back to it if people have any questions about it. In 1919, some Muslims in Kosovo begged the U.S. to intervene to prevent the consolidation of a new Yugoslav state to which they had been assigned. So we have this moment in 1919 when most of Europe is talking about self-determination and certain groups of Muslims are seeing imperial occupation, not self-determination, as the best path to their safety and freedom. In 1942, and I talk about this a bit in my book on Sarajevo, some Muslims in Bosnia wrote directly to Hitler asking if Nazi Germany might occupy the province. They hoped such an occupation would liberate them from a different radical right government, the Ustasha, and that it would allow for autonomy over Islamic institutions and protection of Muslims in the middle of a multi-sided war. So what we see here is from the 1870s to the 1940s, Muslims across the Balkans grappled with the ethics and policies of nation building, the meaning of religious freedom, the traumas associated with dispossession, marginalization, and loss. I'm not sure why we don't have a picture there, so I'm gonna go to this one. <laughs> they negotiated, they compromised, they challenged, and they were searching for spaces where Muslims could participate in their societies, societies in which they lived and had lived for many centuries. How did they do this? So many different ways. Muslims mastered new legal codes, both domestic and international, and used them to stake claims for political autonomy and confessional sovereignty. 
They fought with justice ministers to assert their rights to define religious ter- freedom on terms that respected Islamic legal and, eth- uh, legal and ethical norms. They combated Christianization and proselytization and called out the myth of European secularism, which drew upon Christian morality and ethics, but somehow repackaged it as supposedly universal. Muslim intellectuals and writers used the power of the pen to counter historical narratives that posited the Ottomans as backwards and Muslims as foreign, reminding their compatriots that their history was European. And in Yugoslavia, Muslims demanded and won a constitutional clause that secured a place for Sharia in their country's legal structures. When political negotiating didn't work, Muslims developed alternate alternative movements and activist organizations to disrupt existing power structures. A broad range of Muslim movements, reformists, traditionalists, revivalists, progressives, nationalists, socialists, fascists, and Islamists all developed in relation to and as part of European political, ideological, social, and legal transformations. Whoopsie, I didn't want to go there yet. So Europe's, if Europe's Muslims were part of the grand narratives of 19th century and 20th century European history, why are they largely missing from the general histories themselves? And how does European history look different when we start telling it from the perspectives of Muslims? And this is really the starting point of my book, the question I wanted to sort of grapple with. So Muslims in the Making of Modern Europe is a collective history of several generations of Muslim men, women, and children that tries to understand what European nation building, legal development, and state building looks like when we tell it from the perspective of Muslims. The Muslims at the center of the book are overwhelmingly local Muslims. That is, they came from families who had lived in the Balkans for centuries at least. We often hear the terms autochnitis or indigenous or native used. Um, They include men and women and children, merchants and peasants and landowners, muftis, teachers, students, literate, illiterate. These Muslims spoke many different local languages, Albanian, Bulgarian, Bosnian, Croatian, Turkish, Tatar, Serbian, Romani. Um, They also spoke regional dialects that drew from these languages. And many also wrote, read, and spoke uh, Arabic, Persian, German, French. And people often speak and write in multiple languages, as is customary in imperial and post-imperial spaces. Their diversity extended to social norms and cultural and religious practices. As in other parts of the world, Islam in Southeastern Europe was locally inflected, malleable, a set of cultural and social practices and a worldview. There were Sunni Muslims who adhered to the Hanafi legal school of Islam and others who practiced a range of Sufi traditions and syncretic approaches that reflected the region's Ottoman history. They also lived in all sorts of different kinds of places, right? There were Muslims in seaside port towns like Ultin and Bar on the Adriatic and in towns and villages along Lake Skadar and Lake Ohrid. Right. Some Muslims lived in vibrant commercial cities in the Balkan interior like Sarajevo and Skopje or smaller towns like Tuzla, Tetovo and Novi Pazar. Many Muslims lived in remote mountainous villages. And while there weren't very many uh, villages right in this particular image, I absolutely love this photo that my husband took while we were hiking through these mountains, which were part of the border with the Ottoman Empire in the late 19th century. So if we look at a map of interwar Yugoslavia, um, the regions here shaded in gray are places where Muslims comprised at least 15% of the population. And the number of Muslims in my study shifts with the changing political boundaries, but generally it's about one to 2 million people. Now this map is deceiving on a number of fronts and the cartographer and I had to go back and forth about a dozen times to try to get it right. Uh, It's deceiving because it papers over the heterogeneity I was just talking about, Um, but it's also uh, deceiving because the census data that drove the map's construction was incomplete. Many people lived in areas where census takers never arrived, where categories didn't fit them, or where they willfully lived off the grid. But I nevertheless think it gives you a good sense of the wide ranging areas of where Muslims lived and also a sense of some of the research challenges that we face when we're trying to analyze the perspective of state building from a group whose communities, economic networks, institutions and archives are divided across many different states and many different regions today. 
So how do I put this story together, right? Lots and lots of archival research in different parts of the Balkans over the course of many, many years, right? Um, you can see my children growing up with this project um, and our dog who was, lived through the beginning and, and unfortunately didn't make it to the end. I, more seriously, here's a picture of uh, some archives, right? I worked in municipal and state archives, especially ministries for religion, law, education, and interior, trying to read these documents against the grain and find sort of the ways that Muslims were engaging with these institutions. I also dealt with records from madrasas, Sharia courts, and the Islamic pious endowments. I looked for personal papers of members of the Muslim elite, travelogues, Islamic religious journals, uh, sort of academic journals and also newspapers, transcripts from conferences in which Muslims participated. And I slowly over the course of many years traveled the region and tried to look at both sort of more familiar cities, uh, Belgrade or Zagreb or Sarajevo, and also cities that were off the beaten path from a lot of places where researchers were going, like Tuzla and Novi Pazar. All right. So I organized the book into three parts, and I'll speak a little bit about them in a moment. But importantly, for our sake, every part of this book tries to bring the reader into the nitty gritty of Muslims' lives and choices and responses and frustrations, while also situating those themes into kind of, or while situating their lives into larger themes of European history and using them a little bit to challenge some of the ways we think about periodization or the themes themselves. All right, so part one begins in 1878 with stories like Abdullah. And I chase, trace the ups and downs of Muslims' lives um, through the 19th century and the Balkan Wars and into World War I. And I develop here three related arguments that I think are really important for understanding Muslim experiences in Europe through the 20th century. The first is that Muslims became a specific kind of legal minority in European political thought and European consciousness, not simply understood as a confessional one and also not national or linguistic. So they operated in a distinct category of their own as a legal minority. Secondly, I argue that sort of you know, you know, in, in line with this, that Islamic legal scholars and practitioners of Islam were designed as the intermediaries of European states. So they are the people charged with translating nation building policies, which would leave a really important legacy because Islamic legal professionals and scholars would have influence and power in the region in ways that other kinds of Muslim elites like landowners or merchants or writers would not. It also means that by the 20th century, discussions about Muslims' rights, political organization, and social movements often emerge within legal communities and have a sort of legal context to them. And Islamic legal revivalism would become very popular in the Balkans in the 1930s. And I'll come back to that. Right. Third, I show how Muslims, like other European minorities, slowly mastered new languages and ideas surrounding the concept of minority and also that of rights and developed creative ways of thinking about what they wanted right, and how they wanted to be understood as a minority. So part one ends with the end of World War I, right? By the end of 1918, the Habsburg Empire had collapsed, Prussia lost the war, Russia's in a revolution and civil war, Ottoman Empire is occupied, great powers are again trying, beginning to put together a conference to think about what post-war Europe is going to look like. Everybody knows the international system was going to change again, but how and who gets to decide, right? Spoiler alert, not Muslims. <laughs> The political reordering of Europe privileged the idea of national sovereignty, that is, that sovereignty lies within a nation. And one of the new national states to be created is Yugoslavia, right? So here we see this region, and, and this is where I began this project. I was trained as a Yugoslav historian, and this was sort of my entryway to thinking about it. So Yugoslavia was technically a nation state for members of the South Slavic nation, which included Croats, Slovenes, and Serbs. Um, and many Muslims who spoke South Slavic languages were included in different variants of the national idea. But others who spoke other languages, Albanian, Turkish, Romani, found themselves excluded from the nation. 
This was not uncommon, right? After World War I, millions of Europeans were not considered members of the nation represented by their new state. We have Germans living in Poland, Hungarians living in Romania, Italians living in Yugoslavia. So the great powers develop a system of minority rights and protections, which allows for groups classified as minorities to run their own schools and maintain cultural institutions inside their new state. Now, while not understood as a minority in classic terms, Muslims use the new rhetoric and framework to push for confessional and property rights. And following rigorous debates, as I alluded to earlier, in 1921, the new Yugoslav state enshrines a Sharia judiciary in its first constitution. This constitutional provision allows Muslims to define their minorityness in legal terms rather than cultural, linguistic, and national terms that's used by other European minorities but it also creates pressure to unify and it privileges aspects of religious identity over other aspects of identity. All right, so part two of the book then looks at you know, how Muslims understood their minorityness and what role Islamic institutions and the Sharia court played in the system. All right. By analyzing a wide range of political spaces, um, that include political parties, but also madrasas and waf boards um, and activist groups. I try to show how different groups of Muslims sought to shape a collective identity, institutional culture, and political program within the European state. I also show that pressures to unify, right, and to become or think of oneself as a minority, right, and not multiple minorities, um, created fic uh, factions over who was a Muslim and who got to decide what being Muslim meant. Certain Sunni Muslims hoped to eliminate Sufi institutions. Certain Slavic speaking Muslims tried to civilize Albanian speaking Muslims. Some political groups publicly claimed that true Muslims followed their political beliefs and they would publish these terrible sort of critiques in the newspaper about their political opponents and call them non-Muslim or not real Muslims. So I also tease out in this section of the book how the Sharia judiciary created opportunity and spaces for Muslims to define their own path within Yugoslavia while also becoming a tool of state surveillance and control. So for example, state pays teacher salaries, subsidizes madrasas, and then can use this power of the purse to try to intervene in staffing or curriculum decisions. And this is a local variation on a global story that can be found in the British Empire and the French Empire and the Russian Empire. Many European lawmakers would attempt to sort of seize upon the Sharia judiciary as a mechanism to intervene in and supervise Muslim lives. Now, when Muslims pushed back against political intrusions into their institutions, they were often stripped of power, some were arrested, and in certain cases, they were threatened of having their citizenship, uh, citizenship revoked or being subjected to deportations. And in the 1930s, a group of Albanian Muslims would voice their fears of being the next Armenian, Armenians. They thought they might be slaughtered or deported um, and then sort of forgotten about by Europe. So this brings us to sort of the 1930s where Muslims in, across Yugoslavia are becoming increasingly angry and frustrated. They're frustrated by minority rights projects that pay lip service to rights while expecting minorities to participate in nation building pro projects that undermine those same rights. Right? This is something minorities across Eastern Europe are feeling in the 30s. They complain that their local cultures and histories are marginalized or demeaned, particularly through Christianization and proselytization efforts. They describe how Islamic law is being diluted or exploited within the state system. And within this context, we find the emergence of grassroots movements and a robust Islamic press that calls for the integration of principles of Islamic legal revivalism into Yugoslav society. These groups reject European secular ideology and nation building. And instead, they want to kind of insert or create or revive Islamic morality as a guiding principle of Muslim lives and cultures. Many different Muslims are attracted to these ideas, older teachers and scholars who want to reinvest in traditional institutions and doctrines, younger secular educated Muslim lawyers, doctors, engineers, university students, rural preachers, there's men, there's women, um, and the movement continues to expand through the 1940s. <clears throat> 
Now, for anyone who's familiar with other kinds of conservative or reactionary or traditionalist movements that are flourishing in 1930s Europe, much of what is going on in this movement would sound familiar, albeit with a Muslim slant. Which brings me to one of my main arguments in this section, which is that political Islam was part of the history of contentious interwar mass politics. Okay. And we turn to part three, which brings the story into World, World, II, World War II and the post-war period. And I follow these same Muslim communities through the rise of the radical right and the Balkans absorption into Hitler's and Mussolini's expanding empires. And I try to understand and explain why significant groups of Muslims rejected the European political order that was created after World War I, and how also they came to place their trust in new ideological movements that countered European liberalism. Okay. And I ask here, why did Muslims find alliance with the Nazis and fascists appealing? And why did other Muslims place their hopes in communism? And I show how fascism promised confessional sovereignty and political autonomy, and communism promised equality, brotherhood, and also religious freedom. Now, neither of these movements would live up to their promises, but there was also a third path, an Islamic one. And I look at how Muslims tried to navigate a third way. Right? Now, the communists would win the war, setting the terms for Muslim belonging for the rest of the 20th century. Within a year, they would undo a half century of legal and political experiments on what constituted Muslim citizenship. They eliminated Sharia law and the Sharia judiciary. They dismantled sacred Islamic institutions. They co-opted the Islamic legal professions. And they would be met with a new form of Islamic resistance, bandits and dissidents who organized to subvert the encroaching atheistic state. And I argue here that Muslim resistance to communism in the late 1940s, like the various Muslim resistance movements and ideas that had existed in the Balkans since the 1870s, did not derive primarily from a commitment to the Quran or, tradi or to traditional scripture, but rather this was a response to European power structures and the liminal spaces available for Muslims to operate within them. So to briefly conclude, as I stated at the outset, one of my goals in writing this book has been to reinsert Muslims into histories of Europe. Muslims constituted a major confessional minority in 19th and 20th century Europe, the largest, depending on your definition of Europe. <laughs> they were not simply migrants, refugees, colonial subjects, or foreigners, as contemporary media and discourse often presents them to be. They lived in Europe, they participated in European nation building, they helped write European constitutions and laws, they were school teachers, soldiers, engineers, writers, small business owners, and farmers. But the place of Muslims in Europe is commonly predicated on this fantasy that Islam was not part of European states from the outset. And this is especially the case in formerly Ottoman Europe, where Muslims are seen as belonging to a particular foreign world, a system of land ownership and a legal framework anchored in the Islamic empire and decidedly not European. But just as the Ottoman empire threatened Europe's imperial position in the 19th century, the existence of European Muslims challenges the legitimacy of imperial conquest and nationalizing states, which was often based on arguments that Muslims could not rule themselves or were not legitimate rulers or legitimate peoples or local to these places. Consequently, Muslims were often removed or marginalized within European polities and Ottoman and Islamic history was subordinated uh, to myths that posited Muslim history as distinct from European history. Right? And this historical erasure of Muslims persists through the 20th century. Right? We don't know much about Muslims at the Paris Peace Treaty or in the minority rights regimes, though historians like Hikmet Karcic, who's going to be presenting at the Harriman next week, have been trying to follow their trail. Interwar Muslim movements in Europe are also largely marginalized in discussions of interwar Europe, though scholars like Umar Ayad and Mehdi Said have been writing about them for over a decade. These narratives have been sanctioned off as somehow non-European, right? And this is especially the case in moments when European Muslims were attracted to and developing movements inspired by political Islam. 
Okay, really, there's nothing more or less European about Islamic legal revivalism or an Islamist movement in Europe than there is about a pacifist movement or a communist movement or a radical right movement or an evangelical movement. These are all responses to challenges and failures of enlightenment liberalism, secularizing projects, and disagreement and marginality within the modern European order. So if you leave here with one conclusion from my book, I hope it's this. Uh, Muslims were not relics of a non-European past. They were agents of European history and politics. My book tries to show how this happened in one part of Europe. Um, and my hope is that it will lead to more discussion about this important field and more acknowledgement and integration of the existing scholarship that uh, into our mainstream narratives. And then we'll start to develop a history of modern Europe that is inclusive of Muslim perspectives. Thank you so much, Professor Grubble. Uh, Professor Mahili. Thank you very much. Uh, and thanks to the Harriman for hosting the event today. Thank you to all of you who are taking time out of your Mondays to be here. And thank you most of all to Professor Grebel for uh, writing a, what I think is a much needed brilliant book on a crucial but unfortunately neglected subject. Uh, now there are, and I think just from the presentation, lots of you have gathered that there are many entryways into the story uh, of this book. Uh, if you just look at the list of participants uh, that are here attending today, a lot of them are scholars, a lot of them are historians, a lot of them are students of history or admirers of history as a discipline. But just, just in looking at the participants today, you will notice how wide ranging, how, how, how far and uh, geographically, thematically, analytically this subject goes. You will find there people who may be from the region or people who are interested in the region, but you also find people whose work and thinking about Balkans and Europe and issues of uh, religion uh, cuts across some of the hard disciplinary boundaries that we often put uh, in academic work. And so this is, I think, a testament uh, to, to Professor Grebel's uh, uh, not only ambition, but ability to kind of pull it off and to show you a model of how it can be done. So I will not take up time too much covering the ground that the presentation so capably uh, covered, but just sort of as a quick recap, uh, because I kind of want to sell the book, and, 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 and although I don't think it, might, it needs me to really sell it that much, but uh, my, my point being that regardless of what your interests may be, I think you will find something that may be interesting to you uh, in the book, whether the obvious one is if you're interested in the Balkans to begin with, um, uh, Yugoslavia, the, 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 multi, the, the plurality that made up Yugoslavia, and especially the parts of that plurality that have been neglected. You'll find lots that's interesting here. But if you're interested in the Ottoman context, if, you, if, if that is uh, uh, and, and particularly how a European history can integrate the Ottoman component uh, and, and broaden the questions asked. Uh, we, don't we still don't have a lot of models of, of how this writing can be done. And I think uh, uh, Muslims in the Making of Modern Europe does provide a model for how not only do you want to integrate it, but explaining why that integration is essential to the kinds of questions we ask about European history. If you're interested in Austria-Hungary, there has been in recent years a revival of interest in how even though these empire is uh, uh, one of the victims of, of, of World War I, there is a kind of intellectual footprint that it leaves in place well into the uh, period between the world wars. And so this book also says that that's not the only empire for, for which that is true. But there is a post-Ottoman uh, footprint here uh, and it can be intellectual, institutional, uh, but, but there is one that, that is very rich as well. Uh, there is here also a story about wars and geopolitics, whether it's from the Congress of Vienna to how the Balkan Wars bled into World War I, uh, but it's told, and, and then of course the story of minority, uh, you know, in the interwar period, something that scholars like Mark Mazow or many others have written about. Um, and so while Professor Grebel places a lot of the story in this bigger European frame, uh, in the story of citizenship and exclusion. Uh, and in fact, I think that there are, there, you know, the, just looking at sort of who is cited and who, whose work is engaged with in the book kind of tells you of, of how wide spanning the story is. So if you're interested in, for example, in, in, in the work of somebody like Fred Cooper, uh, 
uh, interested in, in, in decolonization as essentially uh, this, this moment in time when the issue of subjecthood and belonging becomes so salient uh, to European states, you will also find here plenty to engage with and, and to, uh, to uh, uh, read. And then, as if this is not enough, <laughs> uh, 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 there is, the book concludes with this fascinating story where a lot of my interests uh, are located, which is the, the World War II, the post-World War II settlements, such as they, such as they are, uh, the communists, the fact that there, are the, there is this problem of the Sharia institution and its fate under this new regime that emerges after World War II and communism, the big question of how does one do communism. So it's a layered story. It's a, it's a rich story. And, and I think one of the strengths here is that it doesn't necessarily assume that you have to adopt one single perspective to tell it. And I think, so I'll talk a little bit in, in a bit why I think meth, in terms of method, this is an important one for how the story gets, gets told. Um, it sort of gets told from the ground up and from the participants, from the people that are observing events around them. They're observing how their world is made or rather I should say how their world is also unmade because there are also a lot of loss in this book. There are stories of how communities are destroyed, how norms are, are, are taken out of what is deemed to be the, the mainstream, the norm. Uh, legal mechanisms that are in place at one point are no longer in place 10 years or 15 years later. And so to do this in a way that captures the broad picture, that captures the analytical categories at play, but also doesn't neglect the human element and the suffering and the destruction at the local level, that's, that's a tough thing to do. And I think this is precisely where, where the balance in this book uh, is so, so well done. Um, I think one of the ways that we know when a book has done a service to a field of study is when after we read it, we cannot believe that the book didn't exist uh, after we've done reading it. And I was telling to Emily before we, we started the session that when I was doing the list of general exams in graduate school, I wish I had had a book like this because, uh, and, and I'll, make the, I'll make this a little bit more concrete. What do I mean? As I was reading from a general exams and you know, we, we were coming up with these lists of 80, 100 books, um, it, I was struck by how there were no Albanians in almost any of the general histories uh, that, that, that I could, that, that I could um, uh, get. Uh, these general histories of the 20th century were telling me, a young person trying to get a PhD, uh, in, uh, as, as, you know, as part of my professional development, that these, you know, these people are not there. They're, it's almost as if they didn't, it's almost as if they didn't exist. Um, and so it, it's, it's, on the one hand, you know that they do exist because you, you are from the region and, and it's, you, you think that this is part of your history and your uh, uh, past, uh, but, they're, but they just don't exist. Uh, uh, and, and even more perniciously than that, the people that have ignored them and that have not included them as part of historical agents then turn back to the people and say, oh, you have no history. So you, you do not figure in the story and therefore you do not belong. You don't, you don't get to be here. Um, the, 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 the other thing that struck me, and I, you know, back in the day when I was sort of trying to, 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 to think about how one tells this story is that diversity was always, was typically cast as sort of a problem, that there was a multi-confessional, multi-ethnic element here that was a problem to be solved. And so I think these two elements, when you read through the book, you really grapple with these two elements, what that actually means to, to, to speak and to think and to talk about diversity essentially as a problem uh, that, that is in search of a solution. Um, and so uh, Southeastern Europe, Professor Grebel reminds us, was central to the European experience of encountering Islam. And I think one of the big lessons you, you sort of draw after reading the book is how true that is and how obvious it seems now once, you, once you've been sort of taken through uh, this, this, this part of the late 19th century and throughout the first half of the 20th. Uh, in the presentation just now, uh, 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 Professor Grebel raised this issue, and so I will not spend a lot of time with it, but the, okay, so why then is so this part of history so unfamiliar? And, and, and we, we, we got already some of the arguments for, for why that might be, whether it's bias, whether it's neglect, whether there is a blind spot. I oftentimes tell my students when I'm teaching that religion is a blind spot that I have because I grew up in communist Albania in a forced atheist state. 
And so religion is not part of my upbringing. And therefore we carry these, these, these blind spots oftentimes in the kind of work that we do. And we have to kind of be mindful uh, of that as well. Uh, but one of the things that the book reminds us and, and shows it more than, more than reminds it is that the secular, right? And this is the point that is made, is not a religious. The secular takes specific kinds of work and instruments to bring it about. So be careful with the official narratives that you get from official sources. Be careful. Uh, and, and there is a, re in addition to the archival work, which is, which is already a tall order, there's a lot of work with memoirs and testimonies and per the personal element that sort of comes into the chapters to really give you that additional perspective uh, that the official account may have not integrated. And, and I think an upshot on all of this, when I was mentioning the method earlier, is that we really, we get a, we get a sense here of the voice. Uh, the legal framework is fascinating to those of you who are interested in the legal story, but it also allows you to bring in the voices of Muslims, whether they are organized into organizations or communities or whether they are not and they feel left out. It's through the legal framework where we get to hear. These are people who live, people who work, people who are try to make a living, but also people who complain and make petitions. And they have a vision for what is not working and they put it in words. And so you, you get a real sense of that in the book and why that may be important in how this, uh, this, this story gets told. Um, the, the one additional insight that I, that, I, that I picked up when reading it is how that frame itself, Muslims, can be deceptive. Uh, uh, how, how, how oftentimes it hides an assumption that some Muslims are interchangeable for other Muslims. Uh, th and so this, this is connected a little bit to the work that I did for the 50s, a much later period, where the Soviets are trying to sort of understand Albanian Muslims in terms of what Muslims in Central Asia are doing. And, and, and so there is a kind of very, very interesting comedy of errors that happens in that period. Uh, and it again reminds us that the self-proclaimed modernizers and centralizers have these templates that they're working with when it comes to these people, that, the, that this incredible richness and plural, plurality of, of um, uh, practicing religion on the ground is, is to them very difficult. To handle uh, when, when they have a kind of modernizing templates uh, at work. And of course, in the book, this comes vividly when we talk about sort of the first kingdom of Serbs and Slovenes and Croats, when they were grappling with this, and then again, in a kind of a, uh, an encore uh, uh, under, under uh, the partisans in the new communist uh, era after World War II. Uh, in the conclusion, we have a, a, this point, which also came across in the presentation, that uh, the, 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 uh, we, we want to understand the history of political Islam in Europe um, uh, within regional context, that it's important to understand it regionally, and that that, which might seem sort of counterintuitive, but that that is the way to connect it to the broader European and global history. And so it, to, to go through the region to get it to the international, I think this is kind of a, a key insight here and one that I think uh, I, I, I find it very, very useful. So let me conclude with a little bit of provocation. I hope you will forgive me if I, if I end on a bit of a provocative note because I think the book opens up so many important questions and issues. I wanted to see this from a perspective of a young person, just like I was once in grad school and, and sort of frustrated when, when reading in 20th century Europe and not finding the things that I, that I wanted to find. I wanted to read a little bit sort of the, the brilliant contribution that this book is from the perspective of a young person who is frustrated even today with what European history, with how much European history leaves out. Um, we have Todorova's book on the Balkans, on imagining the Balkans, will soon be, uh, it's from 1997. So it, it will, it, 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 Larry's invention of Eastern Europe is even a little bit even older from 1994. So they, they, there have been decades of work that has really made the argument uh, compellingly about whether how uh, certain parts of Europe were imagined or created or how they were, you know, in the, in the case of the Balkans, framed as, as marginal, as, as less than. 
it is hard to sort of not be depressed by how long it has taken to tell these kinds of stories, right? And so again, that's not Emily's fault. And I don't want to necessarily, in fact, quite the, the opposite. But as a young person that is going through this and that is looking at how long the field has taken to sort of uh, come up with his answer, why would it not be a cynical, perhaps cynical, but understandable reaction to, to just be, well, let's just leave out the European master narrative altogether. Why keep insisting on working with this master narrative and revising it and adding to it as opposed to just not working with it at all, as opposed to just doing something altogether different. Um, if we do insist on the European frame and the story to tell it as a European story, do we lose something locally um, in the process? Uh, if, we, if, we, if we, and especially if, the European insists on not wanting to be inclusionary after all, whether that's geopolitically in terms of where the Balkans are today, in terms of their prospects for the EU or the prospects for, 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 for membership. In, in, and so if, if inclusion is not going to be on offer, the, you know, why then keep insisting on the European frame? Again, just a provocation. It's, uh, just, and, and I very much appreciate the opportunity to respond to, 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 to this book and thank you for having me today. And I hope you all go read it and, 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 and use it and teach it. And uh, I'm very grateful to have it as part of our reading assignment. Emily, uh, thank you so much, Professor Mahili. Do you, Professor Grello, you have any comments? Yeah, I mean, I'll respond to that last, uh, the last Please. question, the provocation, because I think it's a, it's a really good one. And I noticed in the Q&A, um, somebody wrote in if I could uh, talk a little bit more about Roma and Roma identity and the ways that Romani Muslims sort of mm -hmm. intersect with this story. And, um, you know, I think that what you were saying, Elidor, about sort of being frustrated both by how much has been left out and why it's taking so long um, is a question of the work involved. Right. And that doing a lot of this work is really hard, as you and I know. <laughs> uh, and I, I'm there's a, a former student of both of ours, uh, Lediona Shahalari, who's currently in her research year in doing dissertation research on Albania in the 1920s and 1930s. Right. And, and doing the hard work of pulling it together. Right? And so I think that um, what we find is that, you know, it's, it's complicated, it's financially expensive, right? People both in, and then there's also this disconnect between sort of people doing research locally and people doing research outside of countries and not always sort of forcing a conversation, um, especially in, right, the last few years of pandemic, but generally as fields shrink. Um, but I do think that it's important that we insist on reworking and revising the master narratives of Europe. And I, I think actually something you just said speaks to that, which is if, you're, if the European Union insists on being exclusionary, why keep insisting on the European frame, right? Because that's the political and historical and historiographical and cultural frame that we operate in. And I think that um, contemporary sort of marginalization and questions are related to a this historical erasure that has been going on, right? I think we need a lot more scholarship, right? We need to be sort of insisting right, that Albanians were really important. They were, you know, if you look at the, uh, you know, the prison groups, right? They were right there saying, wait a second, something's not working in this whole reconstitution of Europe and the redrawing of the political boundaries. This is not right, right? They are calling out the myth of sort of a Europe that is claiming to protect sovereignty while undermining any Muslim sovereignty, right? They're, they are calling that out decades before other people do. Um, and that should be part of a general intellectual legal history, right? Of the making of, you know, the European legal order. Um, so I think that, you know, there's, there is a frustration and I personally have been quite frustrated about it. And to come back to this uh, question about the Roma that was posed, I, 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 one of the hardest research challenges I faced was figuring out the narratives of Muslim Roma, 
And I, there is no archive collection where you go to an archive, right? And you order the Muslim Roma file, right? And oftentimes it's not even documented within any kind of, of file. And yet, when you start to piece the story together, you recognize that, you know, first of all, there's more Muslim Roma in the kingdom of Serbia than any other sort of ethnic or linguistic group of Muslims. Um, and you know, they are a really important part of this story and they continue, right? They are, they're not leaving as many sort of written documents in this time, that especially in the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, and we don't have a lot to go on. Um, and so it's hard work to figure it out, right? To find a petition and to realize, oh, they've mentioned in page three of this document that these are quote, Turkish gypsies. Aha, got it. How do I then go back and figure, figure out you know, what they're thinking and how they're engaging with the state and what we can do with that to sort of reinterpret what was going on with the state building itself. So I don't know if that totally answers your question, but I do think that we have to push forward um, and that a big way to do that is by sort of thinking beyond the paradigm of the state and actually taking the European paradigm. Um, and I think what our, our trend has been is to look at you know, groups in nation states or thinking about states as the predominant framework of histories. And I think if we start to shift that to other lenses like the local or a village or right, we then can sort of start to challenge how states are operating within the system. And also challenge, you know, I mean, challenge European political thinkers to, you know, address honestly and reckon with the fact that they have erased large groups of Europeans from European history. And, and that's not okay. And I think we can say that and say it forcefully. And I think that the book does so in a perhaps provocative way. <laughs> um, uh, Professor Grebel, you did acknowledge this question about the connections between Roma, uh, the question that was presented here on um, on Roma, the intersection of Roma identity and Muslim identity in the Balkans, particularly in this case, North Macedonia, Kosovo, and Serbian regions at the period, in the period that you're researching. Do you have any insights to share? Well, I think this comes to what one of the questions or points that Elidor made about the book, which is that, you know, I'm trying to deal with both the kind of diversity of Muslim cultures and languages and regional diversity, and also this sort of overarching pressure that gets put into the system because of the framework of minority, this sort of pressure to homogenize. Um, and there are a lot of, you know, factions and schisms within different Muslim communities over you know, for example, are certain Romani Muslims practicing Islam in the correct way, right? And so you'll have Islamic institutions who are sort of formally um, part of state institutions and who are funded and who are allowed to sort of define what that's going to be. And then those leaders will say, no, this is not proper Islamic practice. Right. And so you end up with some weird tensions and, and factionalization within Muslim communities. But then on the other hand, you also end up with a sort of sense of solidarity in moments, especially when there is sort of discrimination or the threat of um, expulsion or loss of citizenship. So in the 1940s, and I talk about this also in my first book, um, when certain Muslim Roma are um, classified as non-Aryan, we have a Muslim movement in Sarajevo that says, no way. And they actually put together a scientific committee and they develop an argument that Muslim Roma are of the Indo-Germanic Aryan race and they should not be deported. So they immediately sort of jump into the current discourse, right, which is dominated by this racializing discourse in the 1940s, and they use it to try to rescue Muslim Roma. So we have different moments where there's tension and then other moments where there's a feeling of solidarity. And we have the same thing with uh, Slavic speaking and Albanian speaking Muslims. There's moments where groups come together and say, OK, these are our main goals and how do we work together to figure it out. And then there's other moments where 
you know, especially Albanian Muslims become petrified. There's plans to deport them en masse in the late 1930s. And they're like, where's our defense? Who's defending us? And then some Slavic speaking Muslims come in to defend them, right? But they're often from the same institutions that had pre previously kind of tried to disband Sufi orders and Teke, right? So there's a lot of distrust. And so you have this tension between kind of factionalism and solidarity that is constantly sort of at, rising and falling at different political moments. There's uh, another question uh, which the a commenter, he actually says, this is a dorky historian question um, where he talks about, I'm fascinated to learn where you found the biggest treasure troves of reconstituting this history. We were trained not to see where, where were there more finds in the centralized archives, Belgrade, Sarajevo, Zagreb, et cetera, because of the quote problems, unquote, and pushbacks against the new states or were you more likely to find pay dirt in the provincial local ar archives? Thank you. It's a great question. I, I love archives. Um, you know, I found things everywhere. Uh, I personally really enjoy working in smaller archives. Um, some of my favorites were in Tuzla. Uh, and in Novi Pazar and in Setinia. I mean, I've, uh, my heart was always in Sarajevo, um, but I like some of the other archives because I think what you get in, in them is both the, you know, the letters from the state. So you often get sort of a state or national government perspective, right? So, you know, you need to shut down this madrasa or you need to integrate this curriculum. And then you also tend to get sort of the local sort of reports or writings that resist doing so. Um, I also, I really enjoy the archives in Setinja for the late 19th century. I mean, I think the Montenegrin archives are a, um, a, a treasure trove of, of research and, and the, the staff is incredible. And Setinja is a wonderful place to sort of just disappear and do research for a couple of weeks. Um, and that was incredibly you know, rich in terms of finding documents on these early moments, which we don't have a lot of. And I, I had a little more trouble in Belgrade finding all of that um, in the, uh, but, I, but I found some of it. So I, hope that, I don't know if that answers it. <laughs> um, there's another comment um, question. Um, what role does white supremacy culture, the lack of uh, epistemic uh, clarity around racial capitalism and the uh, racialization of Muslims play in the continued and renewed systemic erasure of and failure to integrate Balkan Muslims' role in helping shape Europe's history. There are ever-changing borders today and who is considered, quote, other, unquote, as many in the Balkan struggle to become, quote, European, unquote. So I would begin the answer to that question by saying they are European. There's no quote end quote about it. Um, and they're not struggling to become European. They are European. So if we're not thinking of them about European, then that's our problem, not theirs. <laughs> um, but racialization is a huge part and the system of racial capitalism and the racialization of Muslims is a huge part of this failure. I mean, I think that that question is sort of answering itself. Right. And this is one of the reasons why, in my conclusion, I wanted to point out that, you know, when we talk about sort of different forms of politics that often get framed as radical, right, we never say that what's going on in, you know, Hungary today or Poland is not European. Right. Those are European movements that many people consider to be radical ones. Right. Even communism, which most you know, historians understood as a radical rupture and a radical movement in response was not, that was not understood to be somehow non-European, right? So my question then is why when one is writing or talking about sort of a political Islam or Muslim reformism or any of these Muslim movements that have existed in the 20th century throughout Europe, why are those somehow suddenly not European, right? I think that, and this is where, I think we need to challenge our own understanding because if we think of a movement of Europeans and a response to European 
enlightenment ideology or the liberal European state or the European Union, right? All of those movements that are being created by Europeans are European. And that comes back to Elidor's statement of, should we just be throwing out the master narrative at all, you know, in, in, in all terms? And if we do that, then I've got to change the title of my book, Elidor. So no, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, there's, this is, I think an important framing to get at like why, you know, the why, right? Why are we not thinking of these Muslim histories as part of the European experience? And, and I think racialization is, is a huge part of that. And I deal with that in my book a lot. Um, there's also a comment, um, actually in response to your comment it, with respect to forced atheist uh, environment. Um, and this person says, I know uh, an American imam who in the early 80s made a trip to Bosnia. They were at the mosque and when it was time for namaz, the Bosnians didn't know how to make salah. My imam friend was sadly shocked, although he intellectually knew this. It's just, it's an observation about being forced, uh, it says forced atheist in quotes environment. I don't know, Valador, if you want to respond to that, but I would just say yeah. that, you know, I, I think what's important to remember here is that practices of Islam have been varied and dynamic across the world you know, since the beginning of Islam. And the ways that people practice change over different course, you know, different moments of time and in response to various local and regional movements and trends. Um, so I would be hesitant to critique someone and one's way of practicing Islam. Um, I think that as a historian, our, our position should be one of sort of understanding and analyzing what those practices are as opposed to um, critique. Professor Mahili, do you want to comment? Uh, no, I mean, it's, I, it, it's, uh, I, I agree very much. Uh, the, the, there is, there, there's a fascinating, and of course it's because I've read the book, so I'm a little bit in a more privileged position than, mm -hmm. than those who haven't, but there's a fascinating discussion about how in the book, particularly later on, uh, about sort of the, how, how much room there is for negotiation and how much room there is for, for uh, formalizing and how some, sometimes formalizing, institutionalizing, centralizing practices ends up having unintended effects later on that the people that had championed them just could not foresee in a, in a particular political climate. So it's very rich, it's very fascinating. And I think reading it will, will give you a lot of insight on this issue of uh, you know, whose practices is, is, is the correct one and who gets to determine that. Um, uh, this uh, participant says, as someone who was an early skeptic, as far as the term, quote, post-Ottoman Europe, unquote, used in this book, I have now become convinced that we should continue challenging the European paradigm by speaking about the Balkans as Europe, yet we should also keep an eye on local peculiarities, as Elidor Mihili suggested, so the question for you is, what is the key characteristic of Balkan Muslims compared to other European Muslims of the same time period, i.e. the pre-1950s period? That's a great question. So I think there's a couple of things that are really critical about Balkan Muslims. The first is that there's an experience of conquest and absorption, right? And so these were members of the former ruling elite who are then absorbed, conquered. Um, I think that this person who also critiqued post-Ottoman Europe had critiqued my use of the word conquered at one point, and I had to rethink conquest a little bit and political reorganization. Um, but I think that, so we have sort of large groups, larger numbers, and we have this experience of having gone from imperial elite to marginal community. And there's a sense of loss and dispossession that's built into that experience. Um, and also a sense of how one can negotiate having formally been part of the elite. 
um, and, and a, an understanding that one's voice counts and that they can use it, right? So um, as Elidor mentioned in his comment, there's a lot of petitioning or complaining going on and, and the complaints are great. I mean, I love, I think, thank goodness people are you know, complaining because it allows me to see sort of what are the core points of frustration and where things are going wrong. Um, in a lot of other parts of Europe, right, Muslims didn't have those same that same position. Um, they didn't have that same experience of sort of going from elite to marginality. They just were marginal. And so we don't always necessarily see the same sort of active um, position of trying to sort of put forth one's ideas. Um, but the other thing I would say is this question of citizenship is really different. Um, you know, in most of the French empire, for example, you know, Muslims could not, did not acquire citizenship, um, full citizenship until, unless they renounced Islam. Um, in Britain, there were also various kinds of the British empire had different arrangements over, you know, rights and citizenship and, and what the relationship was going to be for Muslims. And so the citizenship conversation and the sense of equality simultaneously um, that we see in the Balkan nation states, right? It, it sort of levels the playing ground, but then also becomes a way of differently, um, differently marginalizing or creates new opportunities for discrimination. And so I, I do think that the citizenship paradigm is really important and, and one that sort of requires that we think a little bit about what we mean by you know, equal citizenship and who gets to define what that is. Um, another uh, question. Um, sorry, I lost my place here. Um, Oh, one, one quick question. Did you do any research inside Albania? No, I don't speak Albanian or read Albanian. And so the Albanian parts of the, of the book um, where I do try to reconstitute what's happening to particularly Kosovo Albanians and also Albanian speaking Muslims who are in Montenegro are told through the archives of, of those states and also through international archives. So I did a bit of work in uh, Great Britain um, and in other sort of US based archives. Um, and I am very open about the languages I have and the languages I don't. And it's one of the ways, and I, I really do hope that the book will be used as a way to open up conversations. It's not the you know, inclusive history of all Muslims in the Balkans. In fact, I just saw today that there was another book published about um, in the same time period, Islam in Greece recently, which looks fascinating and I have not yet read it. So. There's another question here. How much do you think the Muslims you study um, and who, as you say, in fact, make up a very diverse group were made Muslim by the disintegration of the Ottoman Empire? Do you think this category of analysis was activated by the nation state? It's a really interesting question. Um, so that is one of the places the book starts with this idea that this narrative of what we start thinking about as Muslims in modern Europe and Muslims in the Balkans um, is sort of triggered by the shattering of the Ottoman Empire, which then sort of forces all of these diverse and dynamic communities who to start to engage with the category of Muslim in a different way. So they are all, of course, already Muslim, but the, the analytical paradigm and the ways that they're engaging with what it means to be Muslim and how to sort of structure that as a minority or with rights or as movements or in politics, um, that starts to starts to change as a result of going from being Ottoman and being subjects of the Ottoman Empire to being con reconstituted as confessional minorities and these legal minorities within post Ottoman states. Um, another question: uh, One of the ways that Christian self understood to be secular Europeans sometimes assert an alleged superiority to Islamic uh, Europeans is in the position of women in society and the law. Do you find, uh, did you find stories about Muslim women interacting with the law in the ways that these stereotypes fail to recognize? Absolutely. I also think that, um, so I have some really rich examples of women, Muslim women engaging with the law, 
Um, and we know from Ottoman history um, that Islamic legal structures actually often created more opportunities for wiz- women um, than sort of Christian and, and secular legal systems did. For example, the right for divorce, um, which did not exist for in, in, the, in much of the civil society and in, in sort of Christian-based laws. Um, and so we have examples, and also in terms of inheritance and property rights, Muslim women often had different and better kind of rights within the Sharia system than their Christian counterparts. But I think what's sort of one of the things I try to get at in the book, which is even sort of to kind of flip this question around a little bit, is that you know, when you have sort of widespread peasant societies, right? The questions of patriarchy and literacy, they are all consuming. Every community experienced patriarchy and illiteracy and women did not have citizenship rights when men were given citizenship rights, right? And so somehow, and then this really becomes the case in the 1920s, somehow that becomes repackaged as like a Muslim legacy, right? And not as just a sort of legacy of pre-modern, you know, economic and political sort of structures. And so I think that um, the the stereotype that we find today, uh, especially in sort of thinking through historically is, is, was sort of created very deliberately in a way to kind of position Muslims as part of this backward Ottoman past and to position Christians as somehow forward thinking and modern, um, which was just not the case. Well, as a matter of fact, I, I just want to also weigh in on this because I was really taken, uh, Professor Grubel, by your, in the introduction, you do tell the story of a Muslim woman who petitions to get a divorce, and she is granted a divorce. Is that, that's correct, right? So you, that's how you open up the introduction. So there are some really interesting stories that Professor Grubel does tell about women and their agency um, that sometimes is enabled by Sharia law and and how they negotiate that. But I just I just want to say that was particularly I was particularly struck by how you opened the introduction. And women's stories were harder, they are harder to come by. I'm working on a new project now in the 19th century and I'm trying to get at sort of peasant women's views. And it's, it is complicated, right? You're, you're digging through, you're often dealing with illiterate communities who were you know, not considered to be active in public right. spaces. And so right. you have to dig through the marginalia. And, and that's one of the reasons why I find legal cases and the legal record so mm-hmm. fascinating because it allows for women to make claims, right? Always trying to understand that they're, of course, they're making claims within a particular power structure, right? But that nevertheless, their voices are there. Another question is, um, I was hoping you could say a bit more about the idea that foreign powers understood Muslim Europeans as a particular legal minority. To what degree did these ideas shape the minority rights regime of interwar Europe? It's a great question. I don't know exactly how they shaped the larger system. Um, I think that you know, what we need is more research on this in terms of the ways that Ottoman structures of autonomy um, were sort of reflected then in the post-minority rights system. I know that um, there's a historian, um, Amy Janelle, who's working on a book about this. It's coming out next year with Columbia, which will hopefully allow us to sort of make some of these leaps and understand sort of what Ottoman legal autonomous structures and understandings of minority, how they then get sort of reframed and shaped in the minority rights regimes. So what it, was, I do it, it was, I just want to tell you, it was Amy Janelle who asked that question. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't answer that, but I hope your book can. <laughs> but I do want to say that 
part of what I try to get at here is that we have this idea, right, with the minority rights regimes that minorities are being classified in similar ways, right? And there's been a lot of research done on the minority rights regimes, especially in terms of sort of Jewish minority rights, but also in terms of how sort of German speakers were excluded or, you know, included in different systems um, and how different groups sort of were understood within this system, which everyone seems to agree never totally worked. But this research doesn't really, you know, include Muslims. And it also works with the presumption that, you know, those minorities that are being created as um, are understanding themselves as a unit, right? And so the legal framework that I try to show is you know, that all of these diverse groups of Muslims, their leaders come together, there's resolutions that um, historian Fikr Karchich writes about extensively in 1919 and 1920. You know, and shows how all these communities are coming together to sort of pitch what they see as what we want as a minority right. And they talk at some point, like, we don't need to be an actual minority. We just want to be treated like a minority. Right? They understand this is a game. And, and I love that. I love that they can call that out. Right? They see that this is just some new European game. It's a trick of you know, politics and law, um, and they try to play it, right? And what they seek is, you know, the Sharia, um, the constitutional enshrinement of Sharia judiciary, and they also see property rights, right? And then it, you know, plays out differently in different regions. Um, but I think it's, it's an important part of this story. And it would be interesting to kind of go through how other Muslims uh, or in other parts of the world are negotiating and what they're seeing for, right? Are they identifying and, and seeking rights in similar ways to other European minorities or in similar ways to the way Muslims in the Balkans are? Um, and, and I just haven't, the research for that I haven't seen yet. That um, was our last question. Uh, El, uh, Professor Mahili. Thank you. Just wanted to ask a quick question. Uh, the, the, this this reminded me this discussion of the, and of course chronologically we're 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 going back and forth, but uh, specifically on the the post World War II moment, um, one of the things that I've sort of been you know, encountered in my work is that when the communists are are trying to figure out how to deal with particular religious communities. Uh, norms, uh, which send, which bodies are going to be supervising them? Uh, in the Albanian case, because they break up, they they break relations with uh, you know Yugoslavia by 1948. They're no longer these two twin uh, parties, and 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 so they reach out to sort of the Soviets for guidance on a lot of these a lot of these issues of how you know how does a good Muslim operate under socialism? And so and so I was just wondering in terms of how you have seen the Yugoslav story, particularly in that period in the 40s, mm -hmm. um, are they sort of going mostly backwards in time uh, or are they looking also around? Uh, because in, in some ways, I mean, they are, they, they could be doing both. They do have a Yugoslavia that existed earlier, but socialism is supposed to be something new, right? And, right. and unprecedented. So I just wanted to hear a little bit more about how, how, how they're going about this. Yeah, they're doing, I think, something very similar to what Albania is doing. So you get, you know, they're reaching out and they're talking to the Soviets. They're trying to figure out, you know, what happened in Azerbaijan, what happened in Central Asia. They're publishing pieces that try to pitch the Soviet um, sort of treatment of Islam as truly sort of religious freedom and brotherhood. They argue that religious freedom didn't actually exist when it was embedded in the state and that only in being disaggregated from the state, right, can Muslims truly have freedom of consciousness or conscience. Um, and so they have these kind of uh, back and forth um, with other parts of the world as well, where, where it becomes sort of fascinating and to me is actually, and I don't deal with this in the book, but I have done research on this, um, is, is in the post-48 period and in the period of non-alignment, where Yugoslavia is actively repressing religious Muslims. I mean, there you know, is, and the book talks about this in 48, 49, I mean, there's executions, there's imprisonment, right? There's sort of forced immigration. There's all sorts of pretty severe, um, a pretty severe anti-Muslim campaign to sort of sever connections between the traditional elite and the Muslim masses. But in the decades after that, you know, Yugoslavia has to play nice with Egypt and with you know, Libya and with Iran and with Iraq. And there's moments even in the early 1980s where, you know, different local groups of Muslims, like the, the Muslims in Zagreb reach out to 
Qaddafi and Saddam Hussein and the Ayatollah Khomeini trying to raise money for the mosque in Zagreb, right? And the Yugoslav secret police doesn't really know what to do with this because on the one hand, they sort of don't want to be seen as repressive and not allowing Muslims to build a mosque. But on the other hand, they have this kind of atheistic ideology. And so they they start to, they, they have a kind of different sort of post- 48 story than what we find in other parts of, of you know of Albania or in, or in the Soviet Union. Okay, we, we just got a question from the you um, from the live stream. Um, did you consider works of and I apologize, it's LBN, I believe, uh, Caldun, Cal, Caldun, when when you did your research concerning to Spain. So I don't deal with Spain in this book. Um, this is just a book about the sort of modern period, mm -hmm. modern European period, which is typically defined uh, as sort of post-French Revolution and the formation of modern states, 19th and 20th century. Um, and so the book really is focused on these moments when citizenship is consolidating. And, and that's, uh, so the early modern and medieval periods are, are not covered. Um, this actually ends all the questions that we have. Are there final comments by you, Professor Greville and, and Professor Mahili? This was great. I, I so appreciated this. And I, I really thank you so much, Tanya, for, for inviting me and Elidor for your comments. And this was a great conversation. Well, on behalf of the Harriman Institute, we thank both of you and congratulations, Professor Grebel. It is really a significant piece of work and um, I'm going to be unpacking it for quite some time. Um, as a matter of fact, I was thinking while you were talking about these trends that there's a number of diplomats in Europe, including the US diplomats that could really uh, benefit from reading this book. And that's what I'll say. Uh, with no further ado, thank you to our audience and everyone who participated. The questions were really excellent. And um, we, we hope to have this out soon, um, later uh, on, on, uh, on YouTube. So thank you everyone so very much. And uh, Tomorrow, actually, we're hosting a Balkan Roundtable about the current political situation in the region at 12 noon as well. You can tune in for that. So have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you again. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks.